There's a nasty virus making its way around the world, quietly jumping from person to person, sometimes leaving a wake of real destruction behind it. It's the novel coronavirus. You might have heard of it. And in our digital age, where information can move even faster than a virus, we're stuck in a confusing web of truths, half-truths, and flat-out lies about this virus and its effects. Some articles discuss the science of face masks as a way to prevent spreading the virus. Others claim that Bill Gates will be injecting microchips into a vaccine in order to track our every move. And I'm really hoping you know which of those was the example of fake news. And it's obviously not just about health information. The 2016 election was a headache-inducing example of how quickly totally false information can spread online. So how do people navigate these misinformation minefields? Do they even care about the truth anymore? It might seem like there's no hope, that people are just too biased and irrational to sort fact from fiction. But luckily, we might have reason to be a little more optimistic. You're listening to Opinion Science, the show about our opinions, where they come from, and how they change. I'm Andy Luttrell, and if you want to have a sound opinion, it needs to be based on good information. But do people know where to find that? I talked to Gordon Pennycook. He's an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Regina, and for the last several years, he's been studying these questions. We'll talk about what fake news and misinformation are, why people share false information, and whether there's anything we can do to halt the spread of this dangerous content. So I I was thinking that we could start by, if you wouldn't mind giving like a background definition of what you mean when you say fake news or misinformation. So to sort of contextualize all the stuff that you've done, what is it that we're really talking about? Right. Uh, So fake news is like a very kind of specific form of misinformation. I think, and part of the reason that I got interested in it was because it's kind of a particularly egregious form of misinformation. So a fake news uh, headline is a headline that is an ostensible news headline that is just entirely made up. It's not just misleading or like sort of false. It's completely made up, like the Pope endorsed Donald Trump or something. Uh, that never happened. And so that's whenever we use fake news in papers, I'm talking specifically about like fabricated news headlines, which is really like, like I said, an egregious form of misinformation. Of course, misinformation as a category is just things that are false. And some things that are misinformation aren't even intentionally false. Like, uh, I guess fake news is a kind of form of disinformation for that reason. It's like intentionally deceptive, but misinformation doesn't have to be intentionally deceptive. And of course, if someone's sharing a fake news headline that they don't realize is false, you know, like it's a form of kind of misinformation coming from that person, but ultimately still fake news. So is it intention? Is that really the kind of the the seed that distinguishes fake news? That it is clearly and intentionally false, or is misinformation might be intentional, but could just be a misunderstanding. Yeah, they, I mean, when people distinguish between misinformation and disinformation, usually intentionality is the key thing. Of course, it's almost impossible to determine that, <laughs> certainly if you're just looking at the content. I mean, I guess you just assume that someone didn't unintentionally make something up. <laughs> like, you just know that it's not, It's there's no reason at all to believe the thing, and so probably it was intentionally made up to be false. So, you know, that's a bit of a sticky issue. This is why we usually just use misinformation as a kind of broad category and then fake news is just kind of a test case like a thing that we can use to kind of take the whole world of like potential falsehoods and narrow it down to some category that we can investigate and like try to find solutions to and all that kind of stuff so fake news is is also definitely a term that has at least become really familiar in recent years is it your sense that that term is a product of recent events or have people been using this idea of fake news for a while uh well the the actual like the internet search history thing it was not commonly used before the 2016 election and there's a few kind of reasons that it became big part of it was because like it was definitely a new thing that like the specific case where people were creating false headlines and putting them on what they do is they just like create a website that looks sort of like a kind of a pretty weak and like not very good like news website doesn't take that much effort to do that you just kind of put things in the right spot on the website 
And then you just start making things up, make up your own content that some of it might get spread on Facebook. If you get clicks, then you get ad revenue. And because there was, you know, so much going on with the election, there was a lot of stuff that was being created to take advantage of that. Uh, and so that was a specific kind of new thing that came up in the realm of misinformation. That's why the term was being used because it's just they were faking news headlines. And so it makes sense. Uh, and then, of course, after that, the term started being used as uh, the president, Donald Trump, uh, uses it to say this is something I disagree with. And then so if you ask any journalist about it, when they write an article with any modicum of controversy, you know, there'll be most of the comments will say, oh, this is fake news or something. Right. Which, of course, it isn't because it's not made up. So it doesn't mean mm-hmm. that because it doesn't mean false or inaccurate. It means it's made up. So uh, it's used incorrectly, probably more than it is used correctly these days, unfortunately. So when it comes to trying to understand how this kind of content spreads and why people would believe it and pass it along to others, was there like what, what did we know at the time? Right. Because you could say that, oh, this term fake news came up, but psychologists have already been basically studying this sort of thing before. We already had it nailed. Obviously, we didn't because you've done a lot of work since then. But what did we know sort of at the time this this notion was bubbling up? But what was then left open for you to swoop in and help understand? Yeah, that's a good question, you know, because the, the funny thing about it is that so we, we there's lots of work on things that are related, like conspiracy theories, for example. Of course, it's very different than that, especially conspiratorial kind of like ideation, like thinking about as things as conspiracy theories and like caring about them and doing research and all that kind of stuff, the kind of like typical like conspiracy theory, what you expect someone in the basement with all the pictures on the wall or whatever. <laughs> um, it's a very different thing because it's a passive form of like uh, being exposed to falsehoods. And there really wasn't actually a lot of work on that, even like forgetting about the fake news specific thing, but just like people passively being exposed to misinformation. And I think the the kind of, I don't know, positive thing, I guess, about the fact that fake news becomes such a big story is that it kind of got psychologists to realize that there's a lot of kind of deliberate falsehoods out there that aren't as easily kind of, let's say, characterized by just like being conspiratorial or like being a, t- a sort of type of belief. Of course, there's related research in like ideology and all that kind of stuff. But um, but the like people believe in falsehood. It wasn't something that was done a lot. And of course, there's lots of work in the realm of communication or journalism and other fields that have tackled these sorts of issues. But the underlying kind of psychology of why people believe falsehoods just, you know, I don't think psychologists like to say that, like make claims about what's true and false. You know what I mean? I think that was part of the big thing is that we had something now that was so obviously false and like made up that we can, we don't have to worry about telling participants that this is wrong or this is right. Hmm. Now it's already there for us. And so that I think might be part of the thing that opened the door, but I'm just, that's a retrospective account. I have no idea. <laughs> well, one, one of the things about that that I'm wondering is how much it matters that it is false, right? So like as a person who studies persuasion forever, we've looked at how people approach information and evaluate mm-hmm. that information and whether they're going to use that information to shape their viewpoint. And so in some sense, you could say like, well, by the time it gets to the person, it's just information in front of them, right? It's, it's actual truth is irrelevant. So I'm curious why... Why you might say that it is relevant? That's a great point. So the uh, the way that I've been thinking about the kind of fake news research is that we we want to characterize something that's occurring in the world, some sort of like class of information. Okay, and of course we have like if you um, you can't talk about like people whether they believe true or false stories without like talking about basic information processing or like talking about politics or like all the things that we've been talking about in psychology for decades, obviously. But if you want to like try to understand a specific problem or something that's happening in the world, you have to find some way to like build a representative or fairly representative kind of set of what that thing is so that you can use it in studies to like show people. And so it's not really about why it matters that it's false per se. It's to what extent can we take what we know already in psychology and apply it to this thing that has now arisen as a kind of new thing out there in the world. And so that what we got in terms of some of the pushback for the first studies was that like, like as an example, I think it was the first paper that was published. I can't exactly remember, but one of the first ones was that we showed that a single prior exposure to a fake news headline increases later belief in the headline because of the effect of familiarity. Of course, this is not at all a new phenomenon, right? The first paper on repetition for trivia statements was 1977, and so the when some of the feedback we got was like, "Wow, this isn't this isn't new." It was like, "Wow, well, you know, it doesn't <laughs> have to be new." And what matters is that it's 
important and correct. You know what I mean? That like, uh, mm-hmm. there's the fact that there's other evidence in other domains that supports this is a good thing. But it does tell us that we really need to worry about cutting off exposure to false headlines because even things that are inconsistent with people's ideology, like a anti Hillary Clinton thing for Clinton supporters, is being believed more based on repetition uh, alone. And so that to us that was an important finding, even though it's not. The whole point of all this is not to um, create a new psychology of fake news, but to create a psychology of fake news based on what we already know, and then learn some new things along the way, of course. Yeah, I was curious what's what the the fire under you is. If it's sort of like just a cognitive interest of like, well, this is interesting that people approach information this way, or like, oh, well, this is a real problem for the whole world, and so we we need to sort of capture it right now. Uh, that's a great question. It's kind of both, I guess. I, I maybe I'll tell the backstory about how it happened in the first place. Like, I mean, I've always been interested in people's beliefs, and you know, did work on and mostly beliefs that uh, you know, you do psychology on like what you don't know and what you do know. Like, kind of, kind of like I want to understand why people think things that are different than I do. You know what I mean? So I did work on things like religious belief, and that was my first real interest in psychology. Was like, why do people believe when I don't? Basically. And then I just got more interested in the kind of like kind of foundations of belief. And I religion was just my kind of like step into that. And so I started my postdoc with Dave Brand. And at the time, he was doing almost all like cooperation research, uh, which I had no, I don't particularly care about that line of work. And, I, and I'll be honest, and Dave knows this, I, I, don't, I didn't read hardly any of those papers. I don't know what, <laughs> uh, what's going on there. You know, I was like an outsider in the lab, basically. But I just knew that we would find something that we'd be both interested in. And then the election happened and all this fake news stuff was happening. And I had published fairly recently before that a paper on pseudo profound bullshit and why people think that like random abstract sounding sentences like hidden meaning transforms unparalleled abstract beauty are profound. And so there was a kind of obvious kind of intersect there. And also there was part of it was just the curiosity of what's going on. But as it kind of got more and more developed within like the first few months, the problems with society and like people believing false things started becoming more real. And then as the research has developed over the years, we focused a lot more on like interventions, like really more kind of applied work, really, which, you know, you always think when you've read a grant, you're like, wow, this is what's going to happen is that you're going to take all these like fundamental insights that we learn and we're going to, we're going to like come up with things to like whatever I never actually did. it. I never even like consider <laughs> doing it really. Um, and then it just kind of, I don't know. I just felt like there was a kind of change and that that was the thing that's been really driving a lot of the recent work to try to actually do something to, to improve things. So Yeah. So let, let's scooch back a little bit and have you talk about what, what do we know about why people are open to things that are false and who is most open to things that are false? And is it really, is it just that it's convenient if I go, oh, I, I ran across this information, fits what I want to think, I'll, I'll believe it, right? But yeah. where, where do you come at on that? So the... It's like just transporting myself back to like 2016, 2017, like when all this stuff was happening, of course, there were like dozens and dozens of like op-eds and like, uh, and the primary claim was basically that this is a story about politics. The fact that people are believing and sharing like fake news headlines is just another indication that we're a fractured partisan society and people are looking at things through their partisan brain and, and so on. And then an academic who really crystallized that was Dan Cahan, who's a... Uh, law prof actually at Yale. And he had written a paper saying that basically people are motivated consumers of misinformation. That's actually a direct quote from the paper. I've used it in so many talks, I can now directly quote <laughs> the paper. Um, that, you know, people kind of believe things because they want to believe them. And in the account that, that comes from that is that like, it's what Dan has called it, identity protective cognition. Most people would just kind of think about it as motivated reasoning, where it's actual kind of explicit reasoning that people are using. They're, they're kind of like, using their capacity to engage in thinking to kind of delude themselves into believing what they want to believe. Okay. And then people share things that are politically consistent with their ideology because it's good for them. And that's what they want to do. They don't really care about what's true and false. They just kind of want to uh, make some sort of partisan point or whatever. And basically the first wave and most of the work that we've done is just completely against all of that. Basically what we, what we show is that people who are more like reflective, or if you like get people to stop and think, or if you, do the opposite thing where like get people to be more emotional what you basically see is that like people believe false stuff because they don't think about it that much it coincides with their intuitive beliefs which of course are going to be influenced by whatever partisan beliefs and ideology they have 
But people who stop and reflect a bit more, they don't believe it as much and they don't uh, share it as much and they are better at discerning between what's true and false. And it doesn't matter if it's consistent or inconsistent with their ideology. And it's true for both mm-hmm. Democrats and Republicans. If people who think more are just less likely to believe false things, which again is not some big surprising finding, but it's just completely counter this idea that people are engaging in motivated reasoning. They're just more accurate. You know, it's just like classic information processing. They can figure out what's true and false. And then what we've been showing in some more recent work is that part of the reason why people seem to share false content, fake news and other things of that nature, is that they just like forget basically, or don't they <laughs> neglect to think about accuracy. They don't even think about it. Like they, the, in a paper that we did just recently on the COVID-19 like fake news content, if you ask people in one group to rate whether they think it's accurate, in this case, we'll just, we just use like, Yes or no? Do you think this headline's true? Or, uh, that's not the way exact wording of the question, but it doesn't really matter how you ask it. Um, if you ask them like to indicate whether they think it's true or false, they believe the true content 65, 70 percent of the time, which isn't great, but they they are believing it the majority of the time. And the false content, they only believe uh, you know 25, 30 percent of the time, something like that. And usually, that's what we find for other content as well. It's often around 20 percent. It's a bit higher for the COVID stuff, but. So they're discerning between true and false. Like there's a big gap there. They believe the true stuff way more than the false stuff. But if you ask them instead, like a different group of people, would you consider sharing this on social media? Much smaller difference. In fact, they would say they shared this group, the same headlines, 35% of them. The other group, if you ask them, which ones do you think are true? They only said 25% were true, right? (laughs) Which means for sure, some people are sharing things that they could identify as being false if they bothered to stop and think about it, right? And so that's that seems to be like the bigger part of the problem to me is that, of course, people share things that are aligned with their partisan ideology and all that kind of stuff. But the thing that we were trying to emphasize and that can actually like help remediate is that people just don't stop and think about things, whether or not they're partisan. They, they aren't reflecting enough. And part of that is probably because of the nature of social media. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't incentivize truth. It incentivizes other things uh, um, besides that. So the... Cases where people could say that this is false, but are are not directed to evaluate its truth, and then who share it, is the idea that there's just like a default assumption that it's probably true? Or, or is it really just like, I do not care at all whether this is true or false, I would like to share this information? I Well, people, and this is, this is the thing I like so much about this is that it makes the least sense for experts and the most sense for people <laughs> who aren't experts. Um, <laughs> because people who are scientists or even journalists, when I talk to them about it, they're like, how could you not care the most about what's true? And in fact, if you ask people directly, what's the most important thing when it comes to sharing, they say that that is accurate. Is the is, They rate mm. that more than whether it's consistent with ideology, whether people will like it. Most everyone kind of really adopts that as a, as a thing that is important. But what we don't appreciate is that people aren't in that sort of mindset when they're engaging with content on social media. I mean, maybe for scientists, you don't get out of it. You don't like stop ever thinking about whether things are true because that's something that you build up and get used to. That's what the kind of training that that scientists get is like to assess things and to make sure that you're not being led astray. And given that almost everyone agrees that it's important to think about accuracy, I don't think that there's many people. I mean, of course, there's some people who are sharing things because they're trolling or they're like, you know, whatever. But the majority of people care about accuracy, but they neglect to think about it, you know. Think about what it's like on Facebook. You're like, you often what people do is they go on to shut their brains off, right? They're taking a break from work. You're just scrolling through and it's like mostly pictures of dogs and babies and whatever. <laughs> and then you see a news headline. You're like, oh, wow, look at that. And then, of course, they don't read it. They don't click on the headline. They don't do anything else. And then what we're showing is that they don't even think about whether it's true. And then they share it and then they move on with their life. And it's, it is what it is. And so that, that seems to be at least a reasonable kind of caricature of what happens much of the time on people's like Facebook feeds. Do, do you have a sense of what they are using to decide what to share, right? Because in, in the scenario you described, they're not sharing all the dogs, they're not sharing all the babies, and they're not sharing all the news. And maybe this is just the other side of the coin that you haven't really zeroed in on yet. But it, it just, just raises the question, like, if it's not about accuracy, what is it about that that's making people do that? Yeah, right. That, so it is the other side of the coin. Like, we, we mostly just want to get people to focus more on accuracy and then all the other things. There's a myriad of other things, you know, like, will people like this? You know, how does it make me look? Uh, mm-hmm. um, does this 
in many cases, this is reinforced with like some sort of political aim I have or whatever. But like, if you look at what, what we're doing for the studies is we have now just a bit of backstory for how we run these experiments is we take actual like true and false headlines from the world and then use those in the studies. Of course, we can have a bias set that I just, if I'm the one selecting them, then I might select ones that are weird or whatever. And so what we do is we have a series of like large pretests. We've done now, I think five or six of them where we, we take a set of headlines. The last one had like 74 false headlines and 74 true headlines and some uh, hyperpartisan headlines, which aren't really true or false, but they're misleading. And then you present them to a like, huge number of people and they all just rate a subset of them. And so what you end up with is a big set of a bunch of different ratings, basically norms for news headlines. And then that's how we select which headlines to put in different studies. We, we, we match them on partisanship and they do, we do that. And then they come from that bigger set and then we can like vary them from study to study and all that kind of stuff. But from all that data, we now have a bunch of different ratings on different elements of what the headlines are and we know how much people would want to share them. And so some of the things that are the most impactful for sharing are things like whether they seem important and do they cause an emotional sort of reaction? Do they, would they be something that would be outrage provoking? You know, um, partisanship is obviously, is obviously a big one, but although that sort of intersects with importance, obviously. And what else? Uh, we thought that f- like whether they're funny, entertaining would have a bigger impact than it does, but that's mostly maybe because of the set that we have. They're all political things. And so like importance is a salient aspect of that. But of course, people share, do share things that are funny. And so it sounds like most of this is political, right? You're saying? Yeah, the stuff, those, the pretests I'm talking about is all political content. I mean, some, mm-hmm. some cases we had some neutral things, but there wasn't a big component of the pretest. And I, I, we don't have enough there to say anything definitive about it. So I'm curious, just to go back to the idea that the accuracy perceptions, once you sort of draw people's attention to them, seem not to be biased by political attitudes. Is that is that really like how strong? Because we know that motivated reasoning happens and, and we know that people will sort of use their predisposed opinion to color how they evaluate other stuff. And so how, how do you square that, what, what you're finding with what we've seen before? Right. So it's a, it's a it's slightly more nuanced than that um, because people do definitely believe things that are consistent with, consistent with their ideology more than those that are inconsistent. But it doesn't okay. mean, it depends on what you mean by motivated reasoning. It doesn't necessarily support motivated reasoning with a capital R. And so this is work that we're doing with uh, Ben Tappen, who is a postdoc in, in Dave's lab at MIT. And so if you're going to interpret whether something's true or false, you have to, by necessity, bring to bear whatever knowledge you have to do that assessment, right? And so imagine someone who only watched Fox News, maybe by accident of history, like that's what their parents watch. They don't really care about it, but they, that's what they're exposed to versus someone who only listened to MSNBC. The range of things that are going to be plausible for them in the political realm is going to be way different, right? And it doesn't mean that they're being biased. It just means that they have a different basis of knowledge. And so when people are making judgments about whether, and like being reflective about it and judging whether something is true or false, the fact that political partisans disagree doesn't mean that there's a bias. It just means that they have different basis of knowledge. And so we don't know that that's motivated reasoning per se that's driving that. Yeah, so I, I really like that. And I'm, I I saw this when, is it a preprint or is it out? I think the one that you're talking about is a preprint. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, and I, I forgot that you were involved in that because I, the, the thing that always bothered me about, so there's the, a classic study with um, how people evaluate scientific information when it supports or opposes something they already think. Um, and so w- one classic example is coffee drinkers. If you say there's all this research now that shows that coffee is actually bad for you, people go, well, I don't know how good that evidence is. So that looks like a bias. But again, like you're saying, it's like, well, if I've already come to this idea that it is safe and I've I've reviewed the evidence and I've really thought about it, and now you have one study to show me that it's not, I have reason to doubt it, right? Because it's not that I'm being crazy <laughs> and irrational. It's just that, well, that doesn't that doesn't really make sense given what I already know about this, which sounds is, is like basically what you're arguing, right? Exactly, yeah. So this suggests that m- motivated reasoning as psychologists have been talking about it for a long time may may largely not be the thing that we've thought it was. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, I think, yeah, okay. I think that, <laughs> exactly. And I think that when most people talk about motiv- motivated reasoning, they're talking about a thing that, either is extremely rare or just doesn't really exist. Like the, like the, where people are kind of self-deluding in a certain sort of way. It's not to say that people are rational, of course, and like, and that ideology doesn't matter. It's just that the, the locus that we are looking at in social psychology is wrong. Mostly what people cared about is 
the impact of identity and the self and all that kind of stuff. And I think what's much more influential than that is the impact of prior experiences and prior knowledge and what you've been exposed to, the kind of things that people care about in like the communication and journalism literatures. That, that to me seems like it's much more impactful. If you, if you know that someone has been watching a lot of Fox News, that gives you more information than whether they identify as a Republican. Do you see what I mean? Because that's just the information that they have yeah. stored up. And so you, yeah. have, you have to use that from a straight information processing uh, perspective to, to interpret what's going on in the world. And identity tells you something about what kind of uh, information is stored in their brain because of exposure and so on. But it doesn't tell you as much as knowing about that information itself and like what they've been watching and all that kind of stuff. So it seems that uh, so this sort of bias account of belief in false information doesn't seem to stack up well against sort of just a, I'm, I'm not paying attention to the accuracy of it. Right. So given that, is there any hope? Like, what do we do to account for this belief in misinformation that seems rampant? So I, actually, it's to me, it's it's one of the most positive. I You know, someone I do so many studies that like you just kind of feel sad at the end, you know, uh, <laughs> like you do a, a study on prior exposure and like, oh, look, people do believe this stuff more if you repeat it, even if it's like really unbelievable stuff. First, you're like excited that you actually got the find that you thought you'd get, and then you're kind of sad for the world or whatever. Um, in this case, there really is a positive thing. Like if it was the case that it was all partisanship, that people were just kind of protecting their partisan identities and like reasoning was being co-opted to kind of reinforce that, then we would be pretty much hooped, right? Like we wouldn't be able to, to, to solve the problem, we have to make people less partisan and like good luck with that, right? But what our research suggests is that um, people care about accuracy, but they just kind of don't remember or like think about using it or judging it whether things are true. And so what that suggests is we can just get them to do that, you know, like remind them about accuracy. And that's what we're kind of pushing right now as a kind of intervention. We've done a bunch of experiments where we, as an example, just at the start of the experiment, People in the control, they're just given a bunch of headlines and asked whether they would share them on social media or not. And in the treatment, the intervention is just at the start of the experiment, we give them a single headline. We say, this is for a pretest. We want to know if you think it's accurate or not, just to get them to think about accuracy. We don't really care how, what they respond or anything about it. We just give them, it's just like a politically neutral sort of headline, just some random headline, doesn't matter. Uh, we've done a bunch of different ones. It doesn't seem to matter what one you ask about. And then after that, they do the same thing where they asked about whether they would share these headlines some which are true or some which are false. They don't know that they're true or false ones, obviously. And the fact that when we ask them at the start to rate the accuracy of a single headline, that improves the extent to which they discern between true and false content when they're making judgments about sharing. Because basically, like, in the control, there's nothing prompting them to think about accuracy, so they don't do a very good job at discerning between what's true and false. When we prompt them to think about accuracy by asking them about that one headline, then they do a better job of it. And we've done this, like, a bunch of times. It works, you know... Uh, Often what it does is it decreases the sharing of false stuff. We did a mm -hmm. one with the COVID headlines more recently. It seemed to have more of a positive increase for true stuff. So mm -hmm. it, it kind of depends on which headlines you use, I think. But the important thing is that it's increasing the difference between what's true and false. Like you don't want people to just not share stuff online anymore, right? You want them to share true stuff, especially as it relates to a pandemic. You want them to actually be sharing that content. And so I guess the biggest criticism of all this would be like, these are kind of like lab studies where we're like, asking people what they would share. And we don't know if that's actually what would happen or whatever. And so we did in a recent paper, and this is, I got to give credit to uh, Zivy Epstein and uh, Mosa Mosle, uh, who are also postdocs in Dave's lab. What we did is we did this large scale Twitter experiment. That's why I'll just describe the experiment. I think it's interesting. So basically here's what we did. They created cooking bots. So they were just like explicitly labeled as being bots. And, and so there were, you know, there's no deception there or anything. Um, and then what the bots did is they followed a, like a huge number of people who shared recently um, headlines from a low-quality source. Well, actually, two. I mean, we started off following people who shared content from Infowars and also Breitbart. And then Infowars got booted off Twitter, and so it was just Breitbart <laughs> after a while. But um, So Breitbart, I don't know if people know who, what, anything about Breitbart, but it's a right-wing, uh, alt-right, basically, like a uh, website that creates what would be called like hyper-partisan content. Like they don't make things up. It's not fake news, but it's pretty misleading and it's biased coverage. And if you ask fact checkers and like professionals about it, like it's not a very trusted source. So it's like what we would de describe as kind of like lo low quality content on social media. So we're getting now, we're moving away from fake news and just talking about like the quality, overall quality of the content. So what we did is we created these bots. They followed a bunch of people who shared 
low quality content, in this case from Breitbart, and then some people follow you back on Twitter, right? Even if it's cooking bot, some people, when you follow them, they follow you back. And so we followed enough accounts that we got like 5,000-ish people to follow us back. And when someone follows you back, you can send them a direct message. And so we sent from a cooking bot this like message saying, do you think this headline is accurate, <laughs> right? Which is a super weird and dumb thing to a message to get from a cooking bot and it doesn't matter like most people don't respond you know some people don't even open it we we you know it's hard to tell uh whether people see it based on various things but that's our treatment we just presented people different subgroups of people on different days this message and then because twitter has an open api you can then look and see what people shared subsequently okay and so what we did is we compared the quality of the news content that people shared if they got the message versus everybody else who had not got the message yet. Uh, and what we show is that basically the quality of the content improved for 24 hours after we sent the message. Regardless of whether they replied to it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We don't know. It's In fact, we don't even know. So it's like in the paper, if you read it, we're underestimating the effect size because we don't even know if they opened it, right? And so the way that, by the way, just one final piece that's important for this is the way that we quantify the quality of news is we just look at the sources, because it's like we can't go through and fact check every single, like thousands of thousands of links, obviously. And so from a previous paper, we had fact checkers rate the quality of like 60 news sources. And so we just take all the links that they have and then like figure out what the average quality is. And then that's what's changing is that basically what you see is there's they're sharing kind of more stuff from like New York Times, CNN, and less stuff from like Breitbart and Daily Mail and things of that nature. And so that's that's our evidence that this thing, which is a pretty kind of straightforward uh, intervention, just like think about accuracy a bit, even in a subtle way, and they, it actually improves things. Hmm. It's only it's only surprising if you're cynical, but like uh, it, <laughs> it, it does seem to have an impact. And so like that, that to me seems important. So there, there are other efforts to mitigate sharing fake news. So I've noticed recently Facebook will, uh, you'll see a, a friend or relative share something. And then a couple of days later, there's like a giant image over it that says this is deemed invalid. Yeah. Do those sorts of efforts do... Do those strike you as, because in some ways you say, well, those are prompting a concern for accuracy. So I'm just curious to get your take on like, how are folks in industry trying to mitigate this? And in what ways are they doing it well? And in what ways are they missing the mark? Yeah, so they're doing things like that. And also Twitter had the thing where if you try to retweet the article without like opening it, then they'll like prompt you to ask you if you, did you see that? Hmm. Yeah, anyway, it's pretty interesting. So mostly what Facebook in particular is doing, what they have been like focusing on ever since like 2016 is fact checking and like some fact checking based interventions and, and i think that's good and fact checking is great we need to have like something to point to when things are false obviously but it's not it's not sufficient by itself and the, there's a pretty simple reason for that and it's like it's a lot easier to make shit up than it is to debunk it right uh and even if they were working at maximum efficiency when something is put up and it's false there's a few steps that are it has to be spread far enough that they get alerted that there's some falsehood they have to like then communicate with the fact checking agencies that they're working with to do the fact checking work. They have to do the fact checking work. They have to communicate with Facebook about that fact checking work. Facebook then has to implement the thing that you saw where they kind of black out the thing and then presumably do other things like downrank it in the algorithm or whatever. But that all takes that all takes time. By the time probably a week or something, I don't know. Certainly not within a day. Uh, and mm-hmm. by the time that happens, most of the impressions have already been had for that that content and so it's just not and, and as you've seen it's just exposure yeah. right even just exposure to that information is enough to to see that belief exactly so you have to cut it off at the kind of source and that's just not really doing that and so i think they're good to have but that does not offer even close to a solution in any sort of way i mean i mean a solution would be lots of things at once and this is why like we're kind of pushing for for our idea because if you just i mean really what needs to happen is people need to interact differently with the medium they need to change the way that they're interacting with social media. And maybe it is the case that when they see those sorts of warnings, they will think more about accuracy, but they could do so many different things to like get people to do that. You know what I mean? Like um, we, we're, we're trying to like test simple, like ad based messaging things or like simple prompts or you know, interstitials, they call them, you know, when something pops up and you ask them a question or whatever, mm-hmm. or like, you know, whatever, there's lots of different things that you can think about, but so far the companies haven't, uh, adopted anything. Um, maybe they're waiting for the papers to be published. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure they're on the edge of their seats. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're, they're just yeah. They all oh, once the papers published, then they're going to change the entire platform. That's what's going to happen. So yeah, I mean, what, they're they're doing some things and they're being more 
responsive now than they have been in the past, that's for sure. But there's still so much more that can be done. And, the, and part of the, the biggest issue, I think, is that the extent to which they work, like actually work with academics is flaunting. Like there's, they're, there's a longer backstory for that, but a lot more can be done for that kind of thing to show that they're like really taking it seriously and, and um, not just doing things that look like they make sense from a public opinion perspective. The other thing I worry about those two is that the trust people have in those institutions, right? So, I mean, I've seen examples of someone shares something and then Facebook says it's false and then someone rolls their eyes and go, oh, well, I guess if Facebook says it's false, then it's not. And and so you go, well, there, there's another hill too. Where is It's another place where the bias could creep in. And so in some ways, I'm curious whether fact-checking from a persuasion angle, right? The source matters. So if the fact-checker is an independent third party, presumably that will help a little bit. But if it's even a stereotype that this is an institution that has an agenda, then then the fact-checking may, may actually only increase willingness to share to the extent that any of those identity markers are are actually <laughs> are actually anything. Yeah, it's a big problem for sure. I mean, all the fact checking is done by third party fact checkers and the Facebook thing. They don't think they communicate mm-hmm. that very well to people. And like it's all whatever kind of hit and then you have to click the buttons and go through the things. But that's another that's the other issue too. Like so not only do they have to kind of keep up with all the falsehood, but someone has to determine what's true or false or like false enough to be hidden. Uh, and people might not believe that. What we're trying to like implement is something that is based on an individual's capacity to determine what's true and false themselves, which people can do more than we think. I mean, of course, there's going to be some people who, if you get them to think about accuracy, it's not going to matter because they don't know enough or whatever. Uh, but like for most really false things, it's if you think about it, it's pretty obvious what's true, like that it's kind of made up or whatever. Um, and at least it would improve things to some extent. It might stop them from sharing it, even if they're not sure if it's true or false, right? You don't have to actually like get them to make sure they know it's not false to get stop them from sharing it, obviously. And so it's like a person-centered approach, right? Like you're not being the like arbiter of truth, which is what Facebook does not want to be, despite those fact-checking approaches. And, you know, you kind of put the power back into the individual, but you just kind of nudge them towards doing something that they already, like I said, people care about accuracy. So it's not like you're all even getting them to do something that they don't want to do. It's just something that the platform isn't built towards getting them to do readily. Uh, and so that part of it can be changed. Yeah, the platforms reward other stuff. Yeah. And so if they were, yeah. if you, I mean, you could even think about things that would reward accuracy. Of course, that's going to be difficult, you know, giving people points in a kind of black mirror sort of mm-hmm. way. Because you still have to figure out what's true and false and all that kind of stuff. And right. so maybe like people have, I always get emails about that kind of thing. And I'm just like, I don't know of a way to, to set that up. That <laughs> makes sense, but you know, whatever. So, so just to, to wrap up, I'm curious, what, what are the, what does the future of this work look like? What are the still unanswered questions, problems yet to be solved? What's on the horizon? I always suck at this question, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I don't know what I'm going to do until like nine o'clock that day or whatever. And then I am doing it. There's no plan. Like I don't have a plan. Uh, what we're kind of working on now, I guess, is related to that kind of prompting people to think about accuracy is kind of optimizing it, doing it in a fair different ways, ways that might be actually implemented by social media companies. We're working with Jigsaw, which is the R&D arm of Google, to like do some work on that. We also have some work with a group called Luminate, and they do... So basically, we have like various groups that are looking at different ways to implement something to make people think more about accuracy on social media. But that's it's still more of the same. Like It's not some fundamental shift. We're just like incremental sort of work and like apart from that you know just briefly note that like i've I've gotten like sort of consumed with this misinformation work partly for just kind of obvious reasons because it seems important and all that kind of stuff but i still uh have all these like various projects that have nothing to do with it that i'm still like (laughs) interested in and focused on but i you know it's hard to like what they don't tell you about being a pi is how like complicated it is to like try to keep up with all this stuff and i and Mm -hmm. I, i blame myself for it because i I don't say no to projects <laughs> very well. And so I've just got a bunch of random things. And and looking at your, I was looking at your CV and there are a lot of areas charted out in this, in the work that you've done. And and there's, there's a thread through them, yeah. but I'm, I, I have found myself in similar situations where it's like, Oh, but this other thing is so cool and it has nothing to do with anything, yeah. <laughs> but, but why don't we do the study? Yeah. I know, I'm, I'm in a certain sense. I'm like just a profoundly selfish uh, research <laughs> person, you know, because I just, I mean, partly is that I chart territory that I can kind of go into any area because I'm interested in basically just like reasoning and decision making. And so that's relevant for basically anything if you if you think about it, you know what I mean? 
so I just follow my whims <laughs> and <laughs> mostly, you know, research things because I think it's entertaining and important, but that's what keeps you motivated. So, mm -hmm. and whatever. So it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will cross my fingers that we solve the fake news problem uh, right away and, and <laughs> all the institutions get on board with the right <laughs> science. <laughs> yeah. Even if, although I should note that even if they were to listen to everything that we said, we would still like slightly improve things, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> which, which from my perspective of like having never done anything to have any impact on anything at all, slight improvement, uh, that's great. Like I'm, I'm on, I'm on board with that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, well, thanks for coming on and talking about the work that you do. We'll, we'll look forward to seeing what's next. Ah, my pleasure. Thanks. That'll do it for this episode of Opinion Science. Thank you so much to Dr. Pennycook for sharing the work that he's been doing. Check out the show notes for a link to his website and more information on some of the research that he talked about. You'll also find a full transcript of this episode. For more about this show, head over to OpinionSciencePodcast.com and follow us on Facebook or Twitter, at OpinionSciPod. And, uh, oh, is that the Rate and Review Fairy? W what's that? They should go to Apple Podcasts and leave a nice review of the show to help people find out about it. Thanks, Rate and Review Fairy. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for listening, and come on back next week for more opinion science. Bye-bye. <laughs>